Welcome to the Bold Money Revolution podcast. This is your source for straight talking, no fluff, business and high performance conversations that add real depth and value to the way bold leaders live, work and thrive. I'm your host, Tara Newman. I'm here to show you how to optimize your performance as a leader so that you can grow a business that is profit rich, efficient, and allows you to generate real tangible wealth for yourself and others. We are here to help you lead with your values, to perform without overwhelm and burnout, and to do your most important work in the world. Hey, hey there, everyone. It is Tara Newman from the Bold Money Revolution podcast. And today I'm really, really, really triple thousand really excited to be here with Sarah Intonato, who is first a very long time dear friend of mine and secondly, a client. And we're here to talk about Uh, Profit first and implementing profit first in your business and what that could look like for you. And I hope that, and I know that this is going to be a really great conversation because of how long Sarah and I have known each other for, which is about 15 and a half years, probably at this point, because I met her when my son was six months old and I was struggling with postpartum depression. And Sarah was the yoga teacher in charge at the time when I stumbled into a yoga studio. And I knew that from the first minute I met Sarah, that she was not your average yoga teacher. She was a business badass. And over the years, as we've worked on growing her business, she has absolutely proven that to be true. So I'm excited to have Sarah here with us today. Hey, friend. Hey, thank you so much for having me. And I just smile ear to ear when I think of how we met and where we are now. It's wild, man. (laughs) It's It's wild. wild. It's a journey. So tell everyone what you do. Well, as Tara said, I began as a yoga teacher nearly 20 years ago, and I thought that was going to be my forever career. And it still is in a very small capacity. But in recent years, I have opened a second business which is a consulting practice for neurodiverse families, specifically to support the parents, and in some cases, the children as well. And this all started because I have a neurodiverse child, and he is on the autism spectrum. His name is Rocco. He's 12. And for years, I thought that all parents were able to stand up as boldly as I was, or able to care for themselves as well as I did. And it wasn't until probably into my 10 years of parenting that I realized, oh, my yoga practice has actually given me a leg up on parenting boldly and remaining centered through all the ups and downs that are thrown at you when you have a child with unique needs. And about two years ago, I opened up my practice for consulting. And sometimes yoga is a part of that, especially when parents need to learn how to care for themselves and manage their stress. And other times it's working with them in a different capacity. And I also work with children in this capacity as well, using a technique called rapid prompt method, which specifically helps children and adults who have limited verbal ability to learn and communicate, making sure that their sensory needs are met in the process so that they can do so successfully. So I wear many hats, but they all fall under the umbrella of confidence, clarity, health and well-being, and being able to stand up powerfully in the world. Yeah, I think, you know, it's what you said around having a unique skill set for unique needs, right? And that's always been how we kind of looked at your business in this from the sense of you, you know, you had so many skills well beyond asana. Yeah. And how we create services and offers for your folks that incorporate all of your unique skills that go well beyond asana. Yeah. And I think that there's so much of this that had to be learned as I went. I thought that I would leave yoga behind in a big way, except for my own personal practice and a few very close one-on-one clients and focus solely on the neurodiverse families, you know, in a consulting fashion. And then what started happening is that it's actually pretty funny. I had been using the same PayPal handle for my business, even as I changed over. And one of the moms whose children I work with submitted her payment, didn't think anything of it. And then when I saw her children the next day, she said, Hey, wait, 
I saw that there's yoga in your PayPal name. Are you a yoga teacher? Is that what you do? I hadn't even thought to tell her anything about that because I was working with her kids who were very young. And I said, yes, I've been doing this for 20 years. Why do you ask? And she said, because whatever you're doing to manage your stress, I need that. I need you to teach me. The stress of this is killing me. And I need to learn how to support myself when I don't know how to do it. And so it was then when I sort of laughed to myself and thought, oh, I thought I was going to be sort of trading one business for another. And instead, what I've received is a bunch of people who really need and appreciate all of my gifts and talents. And it just made me really happy to serve them with all the things that I can give. Yeah, I think it's so important that as women, we're open to looking at all the ways that we can be creating opportunity for ourselves and not pigeonholing ourselves into one specific thing that, you know, there's always an opportunity for us to what I call upserve. People would call it upselling, but like what you did in that moment was upserving. Yeah. You know, there was something that she was interested in. There was value there for her and she was looking to get a specific result. And you said, oh yeah, sure. You know, we can work in this capacity as well. And you essentially created more value in that relationship and created more income for yourself. Yeah. And it felt really good for everyone. She trusted me already because I support her children. So the relationship piece was already there. And for me, that felt great because I think in order to learn and grow from a mentor, you need to be able to trust them. Mm -hmm. For me, that really spoke volumes. Yeah. That's such a great example of finding the low lying fruit, right? Finding the opportunities that are easy on your energy. You're already in a relationship with her. She's already paying you. You're already serving. And this is just you serving in a greater capacity. So let's chat about Profit First. So Profit First is a cash flow management system. This, I think, in my opinion, is a very simple way to teach business owners how to manage and make decisions about their revenue, their profit, how to pay themselves, how to navigate their expenses. It is not accounting. It gives small business owners a language, a simple language that they can understand and communicate with others around money. So Sarah, what was business like for you where were you before you implemented Profit First? And I know that you've been implementing Profit First for quite a while now. Yes. Before I implemented Profit First, I was in that place of actually making very good monthly revenue, but feeling like I never had enough. And that was partially because I didn't have a good structure for paying myself. So I was sort of in that place of expensing as much as I could through the business, but never really feeling like I had a leg up to accumulate any personal wealth on my own as a business owner. So it always felt like this sort of cycle of bringing in a lot of money and then, and that was never a problem actually, and then use it to either invest in the business or just pay the monthly expenses and it was a cycle that just didn't feel good. It felt like, I know I'm making money, but when do I actually get to keep more of my money? Mm. So feeling like it was never enough, feeling like, you know, you paid all these expenses and and what was there for you, not feeling good about your money. How did that translate into other areas or impact you at all in your business or your personal life? I think in some ways it actually prevented me from growing my business intentionally versus Mm -hmm. growing it, you know, for the sake of having more for more's, you know, sake. Like there was no, it didn't feel like it was strategized growth. It felt like, oh, there's money coming in and people on the internet say I should invest in this thing. So I guess I should, or, you know, this marketing strategy seems smart. Maybe I should invest in that as opposed to really prioritizing Am I paying myself what I should be paying myself first and foremost? And then from there, what do I have left over to reinvest in my business? So I think before Profit First, I didn't really have the parameters around how to prioritize myself as the business owner. Because as you know, 
without the business owner being healthy in all areas and being empowered, the business is not going to run well. So that showed up kind of an insidious way of like, you know, the money was coming in, but it wasn't being prioritized towards me. And I think as a result, I used to have a lot of stories around not being a good money manager, which is hilarious. Oh, I remember these. Right? I'm actually a great money manager, but I had a lot of stories around, oh, I must not be a good money manager because I feel like I never have enough. Meanwhile, my bills were paid on time. I did not carry any debt. And I made thoughtful decisions. So, you know, the profit first system for me changed a lot of the mental challenges that I was facing around managing my money, even though the actual management of it was pretty strong from the sense of being a responsible business owner, a responsible financial manager. Thank you for sharing that because, you know, what I found for myself is so much of the mental gymnastics I did around money, what some people might call money mindset, really abated when I implemented profit first in such a strange way (laughs) because of how much we hear, how much the importance of money mindset is, is touted sometimes on the internet. And I'm not saying it's not important. It's there for all of us. You know, there are still things that, that come up for me around my mindset around money and how I think about money and, you know, my story with money that doesn't actually go away. However, it actually allowed me to stop focusing on the noise in my head and go and do the actual things that were going to grow my business and grow my revenue. Absolutely. I think it also didn't take long for me to see that Profit First worked. So Mm -hmm. within the first month, I felt more confident. I had a system to follow. I dispelled a lot of those stories about being a bad money manager. And as a result, it made it very easy to ignore a lot of the internet chatter that Mm -hmm. I was hearing from all kinds of business owners, but especially female business owners kind of looking at the shiny things to fix them or to fix their money situation. I remember very clearly my first month implementing Profit First, I had a really huge month revenue-wise. It felt so good to get in there and know what to do with my money. And at the end of that month, really feeling confident and thinking, I don't need another solution, another program, another money fix. I have everything I need. I have all the tools that I need already to be successful. And I think, and this was a few years ago before the internet was even as noisy as it is now. So I know that if someone is considering starting profit first now, it's going to be instrumental in helping them build confidence so that they can tune out the noise and all the fixes that money people on the internet are trying to throw at them. And not to say that they're all good or bad. You know, everyone I think is doing their best and offering something that they believe is of value. But Profit First is a system that I feel is a strong way of managing your money and building confidence. And I think it can work for almost anybody. Yeah, there's one thing that I've been noticing and... (laughs) You know, I, as you were talking about this, I'm like, wow, I think she is one of the very few of my clients who has not blown all of their money on marketing tactics and 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 things like that. You've been very steady and consistent in the actions that you've taken in your business. You've really been great at focusing on what works, having patience you know, being in it for the long, the long term. And and that's really what, what builds wealth. But, you know, the one thing that I've been hearing a lot from, from people is this looking to be booked out, to be booked solid, because when they're booked solid, then they'll have line of sight and predictability into their, you know, their, their money. And that's actually not how it works. 
you don't have to be, uh, first of all, I'm like, why do we all want to be booked solid? That hurts me. That, like <laughs> that doesn't feel good to me. I want space. So right. it's funny because then, then the, and, and I get it. Cause we're like, now we're like mixing, like you mix metaphors. We're mixing marketing messages. We yeah. have the marketing message. That's like, you, you know, take your space and create space. And everybody's like, yes, I want that. Cause women are like overwhelmed and back to back and hard workers. And then there's the marketing message around book yourself solid. And they're like, I want that. And meanwhile, those two things feel very conflicting with each other. They feel very opposed to each other for me. So, but what I think people really want is this peace of mind around their money where they see that they have consistency in their cash. And that happens when you have a cash flow management system. Yeah. And you're discerning with how you spend your money, not when you're out putting all your energy into frenetic marketing tactics to book yourself solid. Yes. Well, I have two things to say on this. Yeah. I want to hear you give some examples around this. And sure. One, I actually remember a distinct conversation that you and I had. I think it was through Voxer when I was thinking about hiring someone to help me with marketing a few years ago, and I wasn't sure about making the decision. And you said, and I'll never forget it, as clear as day, marketing solutions with the right people who are in alignment with your business can be great as long as you're willing to lose the money. Because marketing solutions sometimes work amazingly well and sometimes they don't. There are so many different variables. And I was able to take what you said, go look at my financials because of Profit First and make a decision of like, okay, I can take this investment and go for it. And I won't die if I lose the money and it doesn't work out. But I had the clarity to make that decision from a place of actual facts around my money, not just around what I hoped would happen by making the investment. So it was really a key moment in, oh, Profit First actually helps me make sound decisions for my business. So that I think speaks to what you were saying around, I've not been looking for crazy marketing solutions unnecessarily because you know I always look at them from that angle. And the second thing about booking out your calendar, this and that, I think that many female listeners who you have, especially mothers who just endured virtual school and COVID and pandemic regulations for the last few years, don't have the capacity to actually be booked out. And we don't. We don't. We're done. Yeah. And so during you know those early months of COVID, especially, I felt like I was in survival mode. I have two children, a boy and a girl. As I mentioned, my son has autism. He requires someone to be with him, you know, one on one most of the day. And he's a great kid. He just requires more energy than my daughter. And we lost all of our childcare during those first months of COVID. So it was just my husband and I tag teaming to run our businesses, get virtual school done. I'm not a unicorn. This is the story that many parents tell, you know, when thinking back to spring of 2020. And I remember distinctly looking at my money thinking like, what do I really need Mm -hmm. in order for my business to get through this time without killing myself? Because I could have booked the calendar out and not slept at all because, Mm -hmm. you know, because I was just busy. I was much busier than I normally am in my day-to-day life. And I'm so thankful that I didn't have to pressure myself unnecessarily. I consciously was able to turn some things off in my business during those times. And I was able to delegate more during those times. And thank goodness I was able to make those decisions from a thoughtful place because if I had booked myself out during those years, I don't know that I would still have a business today. I'd probably be like hiding in a corner somewhere, like under blankets, just <laughs> shaking, <laughs> waiting for the dust to settle. But instead, I was able to prioritize my self care. My yoga practice never stopped, it's still happening every day. Eating a clean diet for everyone in my house still happened every day because I was able to devote the time needed for all of us. Um, that's really important for our family's health and well being. And we were able to get out in nature together. I also was able to basically pick up and move. We had migrated to the eastern point of Long Island for what we thought was going to be a temporary part of 
COVID and we ended up making it a permanent move because we were so happy here. So then I basically moved house, you know, during that time as well, which would sound like another layer of complication, but actually for the long term was very freeing for our family and manage all the things that went along with changing our house, changing our school situation for my son, especially that was a lot. And I'm so thankful that I didn't need my business to be booked out for it to be functioning in a healthy way. Now that all of that is over, I'm not burnt out. I'm actually really excited because I'm going into a growth phase now with my business and I have the energy to do it. I have the excitement to do it because I'm not completely fried. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is Profit First has helped you navigate a tremendous amount of change in your life and in your business. And the one thing that I love about Profit First is something that we've touched on in terms of like helping you make intentional decisions. Here's the pocket of money that I have. Do I want to use this for this marketing thing? Do I want to invest this here? Do I want to keep it in the bank and have it be a little bit of a buffer for me if I have to step back work hours or or something like that. Like you start to get to make the decisions that I think everybody is hoping more clients and more revenue will help them make, but it's not about the revenue. It's about the profit. It's about how much you're keeping. Yeah. I remember there have been plenty of times in your business because you have navigated not just the change of, you know, the last few years, but we've reinvented your business and realigned it a number of times through working together. And there have been times where you're like, okay, my revenue is down, but my profit is up. Yeah. It's just been great and empowering to even know that information because I remember when I first started working with you, I was scared to even look at it. And this is going back six and a half years, but just that change alone from feeling disempowered, feeling afraid to feeling like a boss. Like, yes, I know my numbers. Yes. I know my P and L inside and out. Yes. I know how the financial systems in my business work feels fantastic as a woman, as a mother. I think it brings that whole idea of female empowerment for me to an entirely new level. And I think that's really exciting. And I think it's really exciting for me to show that to my children. Yeah. So one of the best examples that I can think of with this is when you did move out East and you decided to, you were like, what should I do? What we're like, are we going to stay out here? You know, how do I navigate this with the, the home that we do have, you know, up Island and, you know, how the time it was taking you with the move. And we looked at it and we made a business decision and we looked at how much income could that house generate in rental income above your mortgage that you could use to give yourself some buffer and space. And was it worth the investment of stepping maybe out from the day-to-day business activities in your your business for a little bit to prepare that house for rent. Yeah. And the interesting thing in doing that and making that decision is that it actually felt like, though it was a time consuming project, it actually felt like a fun project to do for me. And it felt like there were so many small things that I had been meaning to do or wanting to do with our home that I hadn't done yet, like repainting certain rooms, for example, that making that decision really got me excited to do. And it felt really like a great accomplishment to tick things off the list that I'd been saving for later, really for no reason, and finally do them. Yeah. I thought that was like a great example of how gaining that financial knowledge through your business has helped you with your financial goals as a whole. Yeah. And it was a smart choice because the rental market's only gone up in that area. And so even having it available for that in the second year, you know, made it even more lucrative than it did in the first year. And so it's been really cool to see how 
it's not just about you know booking yourself out in business, but how you manage your time and the things that you invest in with your personal time and what your business can allow you to do in that way can be really profitable and wealth building for your short and long term both. Yes. In my business, and I've talked, I think I've talked about this a little bit, but I decide what my revenue is going to be based on my personal financial goals. That's the whole purpose of the revenue goal calculator. I love that. Thank you. And at any point I control, I'm in control, I'm in command of my revenue and what that means for my personal financial goals. And so I can scale it back. I can scale it up. I truly have flexibility in how I work because of those numbers. Now, going back, I want us to just step in the Wayback Machine for a second yeah. because this is where you are today. Yeah. But what were your hesitations or concerns or maybe things that were stopping you from taking action and really leaning into finding the financial powerhouse within yourself? Well, you might laugh when I say this, but I listened to the Profit First book narrated by Mike Michalowicz, who I think is a great narrator. And I think I did that in the summer of 2016. And then I sat on it for an entire year before I implemented it in 2017. And I laugh about that now. And I really ask myself, you know, Sarah, what were you hoping to gain by waiting all that time? But I remember listening to it and thinking like, oh, this seems intimidating. Setting up all these different bank accounts seems intimidating. Or, you know, what if I mess it up? And I think I had a lot of old perfectionistic tendencies through the years that I've thankfully using yoga and other tools released a lot of. But I think I had this fear of doing it wrong that prevented me from just doing it and just getting started. And, you know, since then I really realized that I'm going to make mistakes every single day of the year. I'm sure I make mistakes of profit first too. I'm not, you know, some perfect being, but I'm not afraid to make the mistakes now. And I think that I have the support in my life. I know that I have the support in my life through you, through the Bold Profit Academy, through my accountant, you know, through people who I trust to help me if I make mistakes or if questions come up and I don't know what to do. I think that fear of making a mistake, not doing it right was really strong for me in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think also the fear of what if I make a mistake and I don't know how to fix it, or I don't know who to call to help me fix it, or it's really expensive to fix. I think there were those questions back then as well, because I didn't really have a lot of people who I trusted in my life who understood profit first at that time to go to. And it seemed more intimidating to do it alone. Whereas now the reality is I'm not doing it alone. I think the unknown, right, is always really gets us really in our heads. Yeah. Not knowing, is this really going to work? Am I going to go through all this effort and then it's not going to pan out or I'm not going to like it? Or am I going to go through all these uh, opening all these bank accounts and then I'm not going to use them and that'll be a waste of my time. Yeah. I I can think of so many reasons that we, we put in our way. And I, I will add that. So I laugh about this all the time, especially with Mike, but I didn't actually read that book until after I got certified uh, yeah. because there's certain parts of that book that are intimidating, that are yeah. complicated. Yeah. And he and I have had that conversation where I'm like, I think this jumped the learning curve way too far down. Mm. Like, I think you made assumptions about people's business acumen and financial literacy <laughs> when you when you wrote this book. And he just shakes his head at me and he's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. And, and, and that's why he has an army full of, of yes. professionals to go and help, you know, implement this in people's businesses, but it is, it can be a little dense. It can be a little thick, but I will say once I actually just went and did it easy breezy. Yeah. It's so easy. It's one of those things that you make a big deal of in your head and then you actually do it. And though it takes energy, it's very straightforward. And I think that was the biggest surprise. Once I set the things up, I mean, like setting up the accounts is the hardest part and it did not take long, 
But once I set the accounts up and verified them, you know, like that was the longest part of the process. It was so easy and it's still so easy. And I think that was the surprise. You know, I think the idea of changing a whole money management system sounds so intimidating to anyone. But in reality, it's so straightforward and so easy. I think I remember laughing at myself after I went and did the thing. But, oh, you made this a big deal in your head for a year, Sarah. And for what? This was so easy. You could have just done it a year ago in you know a couple of days and it would have been done already. But you know, you do things when you're ready. You do things when you feel like you can take that leap. And I'm really glad that I did. And I will say, confessional here, that I recently took a month where I did not implement profit first consciously just for one month as as a thoughtful decision. I've been doing it for five years because I had some bigger personal expenses come up and I wanted to give myself a little more flexibility in how I manage the money. And I'll just straight up tell you, I did not like it. I did not like it one bit. It was such a joyful reminder actually of why I take the time to do my money allocations regularly, why I work with this system. And I was talking to a friend about it. I said, you know, it's sort of like when you go on vacation, but your vacation's a little too long. And when you initially start, you're so excited to go on vacation and it feels great. And you're thankful for the flexibility and you're thankful for, you know, the time off to stay up late and watch movies or go out or eat differently and just be more flexible. And then after a few weeks of that, it's like, at least with me, I'm like, I cannot wait to get up at 530 tomorrow, finally, and like go to bed early and, you know, not go out at night and just be quiet and do my things that bring me simple levels of joy in my life. And for me, that little experiment of a brief hiatus from profit first felt like a homecoming in the end. And it was really good reminder as to why I put the effort in regularly, why I do what I do. And it's no different from why I take the time to cook healthy meals for myself, even though it's more effort than just driving through a takeout window in the end. Um, Simple, but a thoughtful use of energy. And the result that I get from that use of energy is very, very powerful and very worthwhile, not just with the money itself, but again, that mental management around money, that confidence level for me is just as important as the actual money itself. Yeah. I love that you brought up the confidence piece, right? Because, you know, when we were talking about what were some of the things that were standing in your way and, you know, the unknown money management for women is very unknown, even still. Yeah. And you know there's a statistic that I read put out in a survey, a research uh, survey by UBS and 51% I'm going to I'm like saying this slowly because I'm actually going to pull up my I think I'm going to pull it up on my phone where I have it so I don't miss misspeak it. It's 51% of married women don't make the financial decisions in their home. Mm. However, almost 100% of them are responsible for making charitable contributions. Oh, that's really interesting. It was because, and maybe you'll follow me on this, this rabbit hole. So one of my biggest concerns that I see sometimes when women talk about money is this like prioritization of impact over income. Mm. You know, women will tell me all about the impact that they want to make and how they're they want to give away their money and their time and their energy. But when it comes to talking about making money, we start to get not so on firm ground. We start to get a little, a little shaky. And I think women need to be less concerned with giving their money away to charity. And I'm all for charitable contributions. I give both money, time, you know, energy, all those things. So I just want to be clear that, that I'm holding two thoughts in this conversation at one time. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm certainly understand that certain like parts of people's religious beliefs come from 
this tithing and you tithe 10% before anything else because you know of the importance that God plays in the role yeah. of the making of the money and all those things. It's, it's not even what I just, I just want to really say that I think women need to be less concerned with giving their money away to charity and more concerned with building their own wealth. Because when I think when we're in this, when we list, when we're listening, because when we look at the marketing, it's a lot about women making an impact. Mm -hmm. It's a lot about women giving their money away. Mm. It's making money so they can give money. But what about just making money to make money? Why is that not okay? Well, I think it's, for me, it's both. And I know you and I have had the conversations, you know, around how much money do you really need or want? Yes, we want to build wealth, but you know, you and I are not the types to like have the 10 super yachts and then water ski behind them and land our helicopters on top. No shame if that's something that inspires you. But you know, what motivates you behind the money? And I think for me, being able to, yes, build wealth for myself, give my children a greater life, create a legacy for them, have a daily life that makes me happy and not feel stressed. And let me tell you something, if you have a child with autism or needs, and you're paying for more doctor's appointments, higher levels of food in their diet, you know, all different kinds of special therapies and stuff, that day-to-day life in a peaceful way takes a lot of money. And, you know, being able to have a life that feels peaceful and joyful for me is something that I feel very strongly about having our quality of life is very strong, is very important to me. And that requires money for the children that I'm, that I have full stop. And I don't feel bad about it. I don't, I don't ever think of like, Oh, poor me. I have to spend this amount on my son to help him. No, I'm glad to spend it. But on the flip side, I also really like the idea of tithing and giving a certain percentage because one I think of all the families whose kids have a similar diagnosis to mine who don't have the level of ease that I have in my life. And I like to think about how can I make a bigger splash and create something that also can affect them in a positive way. And I think that happens both in the quality of life piece and in the tithing piece in my world. Brief example we had to do some very strong advocating for my son to receive appropriate schooling where we live. And about a year ago, we had to invest time, energy, financial resources in an attorney to make that happen. And it was a very intense process. It was a very arduous process. My son was home with us for the first three months of the school year while we were doing this, um, 24 hours a day. This is after COVID and kids were, you know, back in school, except that he wasn't because his program was not yet created for him. And as we were going to bat for him, there were many moments that were so draining that I would look at my husband and say, like, do we want to give up? This is costing us a lot of money. We're exhausted. We're parenting 24 hours a day. Do we really want to keep going? And at the end of the day, we always looked at each other and said, yes, we have to be the ones to keep going because we want to make a difference in this community. We know he's not the only kid with needs who's going to come through here. And there are already other kids who are benefiting directly from the people that were hired to support my child, from the program that was created to support him. And I'm so thankful that our investment in his quality of life didn't just impact him. It impacted the whole town. It impacted the whole community. And we would never have been able to make that difference if we didn't have the personal wealth that we've created in our lives. And then on the flip side, it made me think about all the families who are settling for school programs that are not the right fit for their children, are not receiving the services that they need to receive because they are working full-time outside the home. They have no caregiver for their child. If they wanted to go to legal battle like this, they can't afford the tens of thousands of dollars that it costs in attorney's fees. And they're just too tapped out to do this. So it makes me look at how can I create more, serve the community more, both in using my wealth to make a difference directly, but also in giving back to families in some way that 
can be special and personalized because it all these things make me excited to go back into my business and make more money. And I think that's really the bottom line is it's not enough for me to accumulate a lot just for myself. And I know that you and I've talked about that of like the money's great at the same time, the money's not everything. Yep. And what I want people to take away from this conversation is that Sarah's putting her oxygen mask on first. Yes. Right. And I'm putting my oxygen mask on first because the way that this conversation around impact versus income shows up. And first I want to say that, you know, based on this study where we see that 51% of married women don't make the financial decisions in their home, but almost a hundred percent of them make the charitable donations and decisions. We're looking at what is known giving money away versus what's unknown making financial decisions. And we know, and so do the marketers that you're more likely to do what's safe and known than the unknown. Mm. So if they can market to you through impact, because you understand charitable giving and giving the money away, you're going to buy it because that's a much more comfortable place to be than the unknown, which is making financial decisions, the financial decisions to require to run a profitable business. And so what impact winds up getting translated at to in business for women is I'm going to make my services program and programs accessible, Mm. which is just code for undercharging. Yeah. Or I want to make money so I can give to the causes that are important, which is code for I'm uncomfortable managing my money. So I'm just going to give it away. Or I want to be seen as a good girl. So I'm going to give my money away. Ooh, that's so that, that one gets me a little bit. Like, you know, I know good girl thing. Like, I mean, I'm in my early forties. I went to Catholic school. Like I, I remember a couple of years ago, I had to go to court to argue for like a parking ticket or something stupid. And I remember my dad, who's a retired police officer telling me like, oh, before you go to court, make sure you dress like a lady and act polite. And I'm like, I'm in my mid thirties. And you're telling me to like dress like a lady and act polite. It like took me back to those years of like, sit still, look pretty, be a people pleaser. And I think so many women still carry those old stories or tendencies. And it's interesting in my consulting practice, the parents who I coach who need to go to bat for their kids so often come to me saying, I know I have the tendency to people please and not want to make a splash and not want to cause, you know, the ripple effect and not want to upset anybody and want to be well liked and all of these things. And it's like, what if we just stop doing that? I'm uncomfortable saying no. So when people yeah. ask me to make charitable contributions, I say yes when I maybe want to say no. Yeah. And and what happens is is women are already undercharging. Yeah. So they have too much work. Yeah. And not enough money. And what you do make gets donated because hashtag impact, which leaves you panicked about how you're going to make ends meet for yourself. Because if you dig deep enough, you do actually want this money for you. And we start to believe, and I know that this has come up for you too. You know, we start to believe that we're doing it wrong because there's some influencer somewhere that has all of this impact and is also living this luxury life. And so people start to wonder how come it works for them and it doesn't work for me? How come they can prioritize impact and make money and look like they're living this big life? But when I prioritize impact, I'm undercharging and over delivering and I have nothing left at the end of the day. And it makes women feel like a failure. Yeah. And we're already coming from behind where we weren't raised with the language of money. And so we start to make ourselves wrong, which is shame, Yeah. right? And then it perpetuates the cycle because then folks are like, well, I need to crack the code. Yeah. And I need to figure out how 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 I'm going to have this impact and make this money, right? And now you're just giving more money to these influencers and these web celebs that just keep you, you're basically hustling for program payments. Yeah. And we have to really look at the, patriarchal conditioning that we have around money 
because we have the conditioning men make and manage the money women give it away yeah yeah right and so when we talk about you know stepping into this place of being a financial powerhouse what does that look like to you what have you you know what has how has this looked across your journey because like we've already said it hasn't even always been about the amount of money you're making i think there's this place of radical ownership of what you want as a woman as a business owner for me as a mother as well and being unafraid to admit that and for me you know what i want and the legacy that i want to create is really big and powerful and you know i think i was conditioned for so many years to just have enough or like you don't need more like just have enough just enough or be a just enough or and i remember i redid your revenue goal calculator a few months ago and i remember just going in and putting in all the numbers of what I wanted to create in my life unapologetically from a place of this is what I want to create. And I don't need to apologize for how big it is. I don't need to apologize for, you know, the money I want to save or invest or anything like that. And I remember when I, you know, entered everything in and then got the number back of how much I would want to bring in for my business each month. Instead of feeling scared, I felt like, oh, this is going to be a fun adventure. And for me alone, that was a sign that I had come a long way because in the past, I would have done that, put the numbers in, gotten the monthly revenue amount back, felt guilty about it. And like, oh, who am I to have that or work towards that? Or why do I need that? I should just settle for less. And just the fact that I didn't feel that way was a huge win. Just the fact that I was like, all right, you're going to go create something big now. Awesome. Get to work and have fun with it. Let it be a joyful experience, not one of like white knuckling things and feeling guilty behind the scenes or feeling resentful because you're overdoing things or burdening yourself or burning yourself out. And that mindset shift alone is when I knew that I'd come a long way already. And You know, every month when I look at my numbers now, even though they're not at that amount that I'm striving for yet, I get excited and think about, all right, well, what's next for me? Because for me, making an impact is also about how many people can I really help to transform their lives? Not how many people can buy my $10 thing and then never use it and have it sit in their inbox collecting dust forever because they didn't value it. So they never got the transformation out of it, right? Like how many people can I really work with at a level that requires them to show up and powerfully transform their lives? Because to me, that's real impact. And Mm -hmm. that's kind of the amount I always think about when pricing something of, you know, what does someone need to pay for this product or service that allows them to have enough skin in the game that they really show up and that their life is different on the other side of it. Because for me, that's impact. I How many things have you paid for at some you know minimal amount and then never really showed up for it or used it? It wasn't powerful to you because you didn't value it. So I often think of impact not just as how much money can I donate this month, which I do find exciting, but also how... Can I inspire people to really dive in and show up and create the change that they want? What dollar amount is required for them to take that seriously? And that's often how I price my services. Yeah. True transformation, being a conduit for change. Yeah. And even if it's one person, the ripple effect of that one person could be tremendous. Totally. Yeah. So what are you... And I love that you use the revenue goal calculator to kind of dream and expand what you think is possible for you. Because I think that's another thing women don't do enough is they don't really dream about what's possible for them financially. And, you know, 
allowing themselves to say, well, what if, and what's possible when, and really kind of stretching and expanding on that. And I know that for me, you know, the Bold Profit Academy is around helping women get paid six figures. And that looks like about $200,000, $250,000 in revenue based on profit first. And I get a lot of usually bros who are like, do you have a limiting mindset, Tara? What? Tara, is that a limiting mindset that like you're not encouraging them to have a million dollar business? I'm like, no, I'd like to see them get paid six figures and then we can talk about what to do next. Because yeah. I feel like paying yourself six figures is that first benchmark into what else is possible. Like what, then what? And I, I get that like we don't all need six figures and our number might look different. That's fine. What I'm basically saying though, is that you're paying yourself more than enough is, is when I say six figures, right? Right. And then what's possible? Because when we can see that we're providing financial stability for ourselves, it calms our nervous systems. And I actually think that's what's needed to step into those larger financial dreams and visions when we know that that we're taken care of. And to some respect, it doesn't really matter how much money you're paying yourself. For profit for Implementing profit first in itself is a nervous system regulator. Yeah. And I think it allows you to take bite-sized steps in your journey instead of like the bros saying, oh, why don't you just tell them to make a million dollars a year? Well, like you said, what first, don't you want to make six figures and, you know, give that a whirly whirl? I always think of the story of Charles Barkley. You're a Gen Xer like me. And, and I remember he was a pro basketball player back in the day. And there was a story about him playing collegiate basketball. He was very talented, but his coach said to him, you know, Charles, I don't want to cut you from the team, but I need you to go and lose 10 pounds. You need to work on your fitness. And so he went and he did. And he came back. And a couple of weeks later, the coach was like, great work. Your playing looks great. I want you to go and lose 10 more pounds. And he went and he did. And then he came back. This happened again and again. And at the end of the day, he'd lost 80 pounds. And he went to the coach and said, why didn't you just tell me in the beginning to go lose 80 pounds? And the coach said, because I knew you wouldn't have lost a single pound. And I wanted to keep you on the team because I knew you were a talented player. And I was afraid that if I told you to go lose 80 pounds, you'd just quit. And he's like, you're right. I probably would have. And I'm summarizing this story, of course, from what I recall from it. So don't quote me word for word. But I think so many people would look at that. I need to pay myself a million dollars this year and do the exact same thing. Go into paralysis, not do anything, and then burn their business down. And think I can't do it. But yeah. What that, that, that's neuroscience. Like exactly. our brains, our brains can't handle too much abstraction yeah, and still be able to take steps, which is one of my biggest, among other things, one of my biggest complaints about what we see in a lot of these aspirational marketing messages is that really, if you were to, you know, shoot for that aspirational that aspirational marketing message, chances are you'll never get there because you'll you'll you won't be able to conceptualize the steps along the way. Yeah. And so, you know, things like profit first really help you break that down. You know, my favorite profit first story for me was I implemented profit first. I my cash flow was absolute crap. I I didn't know. I went on a retreat with my mastermind and had no idea how I was going to pay for the hotel that I needed to pay for and everything like that. I was making more than enough money, but just there wasn't anything left at the end of the day. And I was like, okay, it's go time, right? And like, I implement profit first and I I jot it out in my, sketch it out in my notebook. Meanwhile, I hadn't read the book. Sketch it out in <laughs> profit. So I'm sketching it out in my notebook and I'm like, okay, this is where, this is where everything's going to go. I'm going to go and open these bank accounts. I hated opening the bank accounts. I hated talking to the to the to those idiots at the bank. Sorry if you're a bank person. They're always, it's always a white guy named Chad or Todd. <laughs> and they think they know everything about money and they think they know everything about business. Meanwhile, they, they're so out of touch, right? And they want to sell you all their stupid products. And anyway, I sit through the whole spiel. I open up my bank accounts. I get home. And I had had a proposal out for one of my corporate clients, which was going to be a significant amount of money. You know, I'm forgetting how much at the time, but probably like $30,000. Yeah. And they said, 
do I get a discount if I pay in full? I had never received like a pay in full. I'd been in my business for like a few years. I'd never received a pay, like a sum of pay in full. And I'd always been kind of like scared about that. And I was like, sure, you can have a 5% discount if you pay in full. And they were like, great, we're, we're just going to wire the money over. And within like the blink of an eye, I went from not having any cash flow to having almost $30,000 in my bank, which would have been so overwhelming because I'm somebody, I'm the weird person that gets really overwhelmed by a lot of money. If I don't know what to do with it, it's happened to me in my past. It's like a part of my past story that I think it's like, right, Sarah, like we were talking, like I'm not responsible. Yeah. Like, what am I going to, what would I do with all this money? But I knew exactly what to do with it because I'd profit first. Yeah. And I was able to take that $30,000 and put it into my profit first accounts and really then start to have aged money, money that was going to sit there for a few months as buffer that I could draw down upon. And it changed everything in my business. And I'm convinced that, you know, because I am a little woo, that this concept of profit first with having these different containers or vessels for your money creates so much room for expansion. Yeah. Instead of having all your dollars bunched up in one bank account and with no real direction or guidance, money loves purpose. Totally. So those bank accounts provide clear purpose. Yes. And having that separate account for CEO pay, paying yourself is so important. So important. Just seeing the money go in there, reminding yourself that you are a priority. And like you said, women often will donate all their money, but you know, not prioritize building wealth for themselves. Well, when you see that bank account just for you and you know what percentage of your income you're putting in there, it is a constant reminder to put yourself first, put your oxygen mask on. Don't put everyone and everything else ahead of you. And I think when you run a business as a woman, that can get really challenging because you're thinking of impact. And sometimes that spills over into, well, if I hire more team, I can make more impact and I can If I have more marketing budget, then I can make more impact. And yeah, you can, as long as you're also paying yourself first. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's roll us out of here. Summarize our conversation with what you hope the people listening to this podcast are going to take away from it. I hope that the listeners today leave with the simple realization that having clarity around your money is an incredibly powerful thing that brings an immense amount of confidence that is worth the little bit of time and energy you spend every week or every month. And that little bit of a confidence boost, that little bit of clarity that you gain from this creates an enormous ripple effect in your business and in your life. And I say this because I think sometimes I see it in my yoga students too. People look at that little bit of energy investment and they think that's too small. I want the big, complicated, expensive solution instead. And really it's those simple acts of doing your money allocations every week or every few weeks that create a huge impact. And when my yoga students say, you know, I need to change my stress levels. I need to change my physical health. What do I do? And I prescribe them a 15 minute yoga practice, but I tell them to do it every day. They're always surprised because they're expecting that I send them to a two hour crash course, you know, on the weekend or something like that. And I'm kind of like, nope, I want you to commit to doing 15 minutes every day, no matter what case closed. And that small act creates an enormous change. So don't shrug it off because it seems too simple or too easy or because you don't have to invest in five coaches to get it done. Just, <laughs> just, just go do it and try it. And you have nothing to lose by trying and everything to gain by trying. Thank you so much. I couldn't have said it better. That whole clarity equals confidence creates a ripple effect is really, really spot on. Where can, in the event that some of my listeners might have children with special needs, where could they find you? The best place to find me is over on Instagram at Sarah, S-A-R-A dot Intonato. And from there, I share my podcast episodes. I share free resources. 
there are so many ways to start taking action and improving your situation for yourself and your child right now that that's a really fun place to connect. And please pop into my DMs and say, hi, I'm a real person behind the profile and I love connecting with real people. Thanks so much for coming on, Sarah. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. If you found this podcast valuable, help us develop more bold leaders in the world by sharing this episode with your friends, colleagues, and other bold leaders. Also, if you haven't done so already, please leave a review. I consider reviews like podcast currency, and it's the one thing you can do to help us out here at the Bold Leadership Revolution HQ. We would be so grateful for it. Special thanks goes to Stacey Harris from Uncommonly More, who is the producer and editor of this podcast. Go check them out for all your digital marketing and content creation needs. Be sure to tune into the next episode to help you embrace your ambition and leave the grind behind.